and stir your heart. Just come get saved, seriously. Just come get saved, get right with God. We're going to be in 1 Kings. I sat there on that bench and probably fiddled through four different messages trying to get the mind of God, and I just keep going back to this one. Several of you here, maybe a handful of you, maybe have heard this message before, but how many of you know when God says preach it, we're going forward with it. Um, I got some good friends over here from Crosslink. They probably heard this at least once, but um, I believe the majority of us here haven't heard this. This may be one of the last times I preached this message. I've probably preached it a dozen times in the past three or four months, but I believe it's needed, and I'm going to go ahead and preach it. Uh, 1 Kings chapter number 22. My wife was really going to try to come with me tonight or tomorrow night. Not sure if that's going to work. We're having marital problems. Y'all pray. We're in bad shape. It's bad. I'm just telling you, it's bad. I don't understand women at all. She just, you know, the other day she asked me, she said, will you, will you take me to one of those restaurants where they prepare the food out in front of you? And I said, sure, sure. So I threw her in that F-350 Super Duty diesel and I took her to Subway. I thought I was doing the right thing, brother. You feeling my pain? Well, that didn't work out, so we ended up one of them fancy restaurants. She's sitting there staring at me. I said, what are you thinking about? She said, oh, just the day we met. I said, oh, that's good. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> a few moments went by, and she said, what are you thinking about? Y'all know guys don't think like girls. I mean, I'm eating, I'm having a good time, and my mind's wandering, and she's still all romantic. And she said, what are you thinking about? I said, like, right now? She said, yeah, right now, what are you thinking about? I said, if you want to know what I'm thinking about, I said, I was just wondering, you know, I think about crazy stuff. If a Filipino hooked up with someone from Holland, would their kids be jalapenos? She said, were you really thinking that? I said, well, you asked. She goes, I give up. That's where the fight started. I don't know. No, I'm just cutting up. <laughs> Women, man. Who, I just don't, don't get it. First Kings 22. Man, I got 30 minutes. Let's do this. First Kings 22, verse number 41. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign. Stand with me. You've been sitting for a while. You'll be sitting for about 35 minutes. What time do I need to be done, preacher? Do I have 35 minutes? I know you got school and work tomorrow, so. Y'all blame it on God. God got to moving, and they had to sing that song again. I'm just telling you, that was the Lord. Whew. And thank you for saving me. <laughs> Whoo! <Whew. laughs> That's a dangerous song. <laughs> Where did I see y'all at when y'all gave me that CD? I popped that thing in the truck on the way home from that meeting up there with, uh, when I was preaching with Dr. Kidd and all that. I, I put that thing in the CD player on the way home. <laughs> I may not mean a whole lot to you. <laughs> well, I remember where I came from. Well, thank you for saying. Some of y'all, uh, yeah. well, you've been asking God to do some crazy things in your life lately. I'm telling you, man, don't give up. God's able. You never know behind the smiles on people's faces, the burdens that they're carrying. They've been praying and praying and praying and waiting on God. And sometimes if you're like me, you even question God. God, it ain't supposed to be this way. Yeah, that, that ain't supposed to happen. But he's still God. It's okay to question God. Just don't argue with his answer. Jesus questioned God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's okay to ask God why. Just take his answer. Whew. All right, man, I got to get off this whole bunch of mushy stuff here. It's time to preach. Y'all came for some preaching, didn't you? 
Y'all came for the hammer, didn't you? All right. First Kings chapter 22, verse 41. Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. And Jehoshaphat was 35 years old, began to reign. He reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai. And he walked in all the ways of Asa, his father. He turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Here's a man who the Bible very clearly tells us he's a king. He did which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Don't forget that. Now you'll notice in verse number 46 that here's something he did that must have been right in the eyes of the Lord. I'm not going to preach this, but I am going to bump it and keep moving because it's in your Bible. And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. Now, God's still not pleased with homosexuality and lesbianism and transgender and all that stuff. And I know I'm probably live on Facebook and the Internet and all that. And I've been locked up on the Internet before. I, I really don't care what they do with me on the Internet. It's in the book, and I'm going to preach it. I'm not mean-spirited about it. It's just that our kids are being flooded with the wrong, with the, with the wrong idea of, of sexuality. And I, I, if I'm the last preacher standing... I'm going to stand on the truth. I'm not trying to slander people. I'm not trying to be mean-spirited about it. It's just true, man. I'm not a hater. I'm a truthful preacher who must stand on the Word of God. They tried to steal our rainbow from us. I'm getting my rainbow back, buddy. I'm, hey, my rainbow don't mean nothing. I promise you I ain't gay. Paul, listen to all that stuff. If him, he's in such with some of you. I, not me. I wasn't that. I'm just telling you, that's one sin I never battled with, and I'm not trying to slam somebody who does battle with that. But if it was wrong then, it's wrong now. They try to take our rainbow. Oh, well, we're under grace, we're under grace. Hey, this is 1,500 years after the rainbow. God said the rainbow don't mean keep sinning. God said, I'm still not pleased with it. After the rain, 1,551 years after the rainbow, God says, here's a man who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he got rid of the remnant of Sodom. Let me, I better keep moving. I feel bog, like I'm bogged down there just a little bit, preacher, but this ain't, my, this ain't my church. I'm just telling you, teach your kids what they are and who they are. And if they don't understand what they are and who they are, send them down to sunrise. We'll have a session. There was no king in the Edom. Deputy was king. Verse 48, 49 is where I want to take my text. Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold. But they went not, watch this, Brother Samson, for the ships were broken at Ezion Geber. I want to preach for about 30 minutes on broken ships. Father, help me. Lord, you've, you've met with me while these... I'm glad you found me. I'm so glad you found me. In love, you bound me. Put your arms around me. And thank you for saving me. And Lord, I, I've been plugged in, and I thank you for meeting with me and these folks, but now it's preaching time. Give me just a little time, Lord, with your power. Help me to charge, challenge, and change your people with the word of God. In Jesus Christ, holy name we pray it. Amen and amen. You can have a seat. I want to take a picture out of the word of God tonight. And I love preaching on pictures and types in the, in the Bible. And I, I, people say I'm an Old Testament preacher, but I always try to line it up with New Testament because, I, I mean, you've got to have both. The Bible is in harmony with itself. You've got Old Testament. New Testament. I mean, it just jives. And so I begin to read this the other day, Pastor, and, 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 and I begin to focus in on verse number 48 where we read about a man who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and he built ships going to Tarshish but the ships were broken at Ezion Geber. And I begin to look at this and the Holy Ghost begin to zero me in on these verses and I begin to see a picture. I want to use Tarshish tonight as a picture of the world. I want to use Tarsus as a picture of that place that God saved you out of. You say, preacher, give me Bible for that picture. Well, do you remember a man named Jonah who was supposed to go to Nineveh, but he went the opposite way that God told him to go, and he went where? To Tarshish. So it was the opposite way that God wanted him to go. Now the world is not the way that God wants you to go. And let's bring it up to New Testament. There was a man named Saul. He got saved and his name was changed from Saul to Paul. But when he was Saul, he was Saul of 
same place, different spelling in the Greek. Now you never read about Paul being Paul of Tarsus. It's always Saul, the old man of Tarsus. So Tarsus is a picture of the world. Now here's a king who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he built ships going to Tarsus. Now wait a minute. Why did he build ships or a connection point or a, a, a place uh, of entry. Why, what, why would he build these ships to take him to Tarsus if Tarsus is a picture of the world and this is a king that was doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord? These ships are going to picture your connection, the, what you have built to connect you to the world. You know, you, all, you always got to have a connection to the world. Something's got to take you there. So here's a king who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He builds, a, a, he builds ships to take him to Tarshish. God wasn't pleased with it, and the ships were broken. I got to thinking about this. Why would this good king even think about building this connection or this transportation system to the world? The Bible says you did run well. Who did hinder you? There's always, almost always a who in your life when you're doing what was right and then all of a sudden you go the wrong direction. There's almost always a who. So I begin to look at this and I say, God, who did hinder Jehoshaphat from doing what was right? What took him to Tarsus? Well, aren't you thankful for the Holy Ghost when he gives you another chapter or another book of the same episode with a few more details that answers the questions that you have? Aren't you glad the Holy Ghost inspired the King James Bible? So let's go to this same story in a different book. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and read just three verses. And let's see who hindered this good king. Who taught this good king into building this transportation system to go to Tarshish, which is a place of the world. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 20 and look with me in verse number 35. And after this did Jehoshaphat, king of Ju Judah, join himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel. You all know who that is. That's Ahab's boy. Like father, like if you don't know who Ahab was, he was one of the most wicked kings that ever lived. And most of his influence came from his wife, whose name was Jezebel. So you got Ahab and Jezebel. They have a boy, and his name is Ahaziah. And all of a sudden, the king that was doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord joins himself with a wicked king. Now watch what the Bible says. Who did very wickedly, verse 35, verse 36, and he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish, and they made the ships in Ezion Geber. Then Eliezer, the son of Dodova of Marisha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Ahaziah, the Lord hath broken thy works. And the ships were broken that they were not able to go to Tarshish. Now look here at me. We, let me narrow the, narrate the story for just a moment. Jehoshaphat Hooked up with Ahaziah, a wicked king. He was influenced. Let me take a pause for a moment. Young people, listen to me. I, I don't want to be mean-spirited tonight. I'm really not in that type of a mood. But I want to challenge you. Be careful who you yoke up with. Be careful who you date. Be careful who you hang out with. I'm telling you, man, if I get one more phone call of a good mom, a Christian mom or dad saying, my son or my daughter has gone into Egypt. They've become Babylonians. They've gone the wrong way. And they were raised in church but they started hanging out and dating the world's people and I'm going to tell you you are not you, you got to sue your brain for non-support if you think you're going to date a dope head or go around and hanging out with the dope smoking crowd and the lustful crowd you're not going to influence them most of the time they're going to influence you hey I'm not had a friend buddy his name was Jonadab go home and read how that turned out I'm begging you young people listen to me Please be careful who you join up with. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. He was influenced. 
God wasn't pleased with these ships. He built these ships. He was influenced. He built this connection point. He built this transportation system. And, and God said, I'm not pleased, son. You were doing what was right in my eyes. And you built this transportation system going to the world. And the Bible says, the Lord, y'all read it with me, the Lord hath broken thy words, verse 37. The Lord broke those ships. God said, I don't want you connected to the world anymore. Come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. You're a peculiar people. You've been bought with a price. You're not your own. Don't connect with this world. And God broke them ships. And can I say, when God breaks a ship, you better leave them alone. Say, preacher, help me out. What are you talking about? What kind of ships? There's all kinds of connection points to the world. Let me just hit two or three modern day ships that we may have built. And please, don't label me as a, go ahead, I don't even care. Label me as a hate preacher. I hate the world. <laughs> my, my, my church said, you don't preach on love enough. I said, I'm going to preach on love next Sunday. I got up and preached on love, not the world, neither the things that are in the world. <laughs> if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Yeah. They quit asking me to preach on love. Yeah. See, preacher, what kind of connect? Let me just give you two or three that I found modern day. I, I'm not against Facebook. My church has a Facebook page, preacher. I promise you. I'm not here to hurt anybody. But just as much good as that can be to get the gospel out and to help a church and to help a family, to that same degree, if it gets in the hands of the devil, buddy, it's a connection to the world. You remember when God saved you and God began to disconnect you from the world and you begin to clean up your Facebook account and some of those people you used to associate with, God said, I want you to cut that tie. I don't want you yoked up with them people anymore. And, and you broke those ties. Listen to me, man. I, I, I'm telling you, those, those people out in your life that are dragging you down, you, you need to eliminate them. You need to sever. God needs to break that ship. Go home and disconnect from those people who are slandering your family and backbiting and and all the whispering and gossiping and game slaying and all of that stuff. I mean, get a hold of those people and delete their account and break that. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to gossip and slander on that Facebook. It will tear you up. It connects you to the world. As I was doing some, I was doing some counseling in my office several months ago, and a fella. He, he was unloading on his wife for about 15 minutes. I knew his wife was a godly woman and he was the problem, but I didn't tell him right off the bat. He unloaded on me for about 15 minutes. Uh, told me every bad point in that woman and every, this, that, and the other. And, I, and, at the, and the Holy Ghost told me, preacher, I said, it was just me and him. I said, sir, can I, can I hold your cell phone? Boy, he went to locking that thing down. He went to covering it up. So he, well, that's my personal business, preacher. I said, you don't have to show it to me. I said, your wife's already told me all of the women that you're talking to on Facebook. Uh, some of them you used to date before you got saved. Uh, you was rolling around under the sheets with them buddy and now you're telling me that it's your wife's problem I said you I said you need to break those connect here's what he said well somebody's got to win them to Jesus I said buddy you are crazy if you think I'm going to connect with girls I used to date and people I used to run with try, I'm going to pray the Lord of the harvest send laborers into the harvest God will send somebody else in their direction to win them to Jesus you need to disconnect from them before you lose your man I'm not going to lose my marriage trying to help somebody else ask I'm mad at the devil, not y'all. I hate the devil. And if you're talking to him, tell him I said so. Music will connect you to the world. Be careful what you listen to. You know, preacher, music don't affect me. Yes, it does. You know as well as I do. You be going down the road, driving the speed limit, turn on the wrong song, and man, that beat start picking up, and you, next thing you're going 100 miles an hour. It affects you. I can't tell you how many times I woke up. I, I mean, I was a heroin addict for 13 years. God helped my testimony. I'm going to tell you, I hate it, but it is what it is. I, I was a heroin addict riding with Hells Angels for 13 years, shooting dope up in my veins, crunching Oxycontin and Hydrocodone, mixing them with benzos and methamphetamines, uh, anything I could put in my system to escape reality for 13 years. And I, can tell, I can't tell you how many times I woke up and I'd try to wash the sin off of my face and go to work. And I'd say, boy, I'm going to go home tonight. I'm going to be a good dad. I'm going to be a good husband. My wife. 
she deserves better than this. My kids deserve better than this. And I, all day long, I say, I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going home. I get in that old four-wheel drive pickup truck. I get about halfway home and turn on the great 98 WCOS. Alan Jackson starts singing Midnight in Montgomery or prop me up beside the jukebox. Garth Brooks will start singing about the Thunder Rolls. And next thing you know, man, I'm over there on, on, the, on, the, on the classic rock and Leonard Skinner's coming on with Simple Man. And in my mind, I'm thinking, man, my mind begins to wonder. And I say, well, you know, one beer ain't going to hurt. And I pull into the local biker bar and there's the Hells Angels and the Carolina Rebels. And I'm drinking beer and doing shots. Next thing you know, I got bloody knuckles out in the parking lot. You're dancing with somebody that ain't your wife or your husband, shooting pool at 3 o'clock in the morning. And you come dragging in over and over and over and over again. And it all started with a song. I'm telling you, music will influence you and it'll connect you to the world. God wants it broken. He wants, you, he wants you to go home and clean it up. Dress will connect you to the world. I'm not going to hit that. It's your pastor's job. But modesty is a good Bible word. Whatever you wear, make it modest, man. If it ain't for sale, don't advertise it. I didn't say this, but I heard an old mountain preacher one time. He said, just turn it into a Kentucky Fried Chicken Church. Legs and thighs and breasts all over the place. <laughs> He said, somebody call the butcher. We got some heifers need dressing up in here. I didn't say it, preacher. The old mountain preachers. I'm just repeating what he said. But is it, ain't it true, though? I didn't see nobody like it here tonight. I'm just telling you, I didn't. This is a good church. I didn't say that. That preacher said it. But watch this. Here's the one we get to. I, got, I ain't got about 10, 15 minutes. God broke them ships. I remember when I got saved, Brother Sampson. I thought I was doing it. I thought it was me that was cleaning up. I thought it was me that was breaking them ships. I thought, look, I'm a pretty good guy. Man, I didn't cut off all the, all the HAs. I didn't cut off all the dope dealers. I ain't hanging out with the, gun, with the illegal gun traffic. Man, I, I quit this. I quit that. I burnt all my CD. Look, I'm pretty good. You know what? I'm looking back over the past 16. It wasn't me doing it. It was the Lord breaking them ships. Greater is he that is in you than he's in the world. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But here's where it gets interesting. I want to tell you something, man. Watch this. Look at 1 Kings. Here's where it got interesting, brother, Pastor Mark. And look at, look at me back in our text in 1 Kings. The Lord broke them ships. And let's read verse 48, and then we're going to read verse 49. I'm going to give you a couple things, and I'm going to shut up sit down. Because we've already had church. As far as I'm concerned, they could have kept singing tonight. I just want to charge you. <laughs> me and you talking after church. That's my, that's my adopted grandma right there. <clears throat> You've heard this message before, ain't you? You know where I'm going. Shh. Watch this now, verse 48. All kidding aside, watch this very serious thing. Jehoshaphat made, verse 48, so we read it again. Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarsus to go to Ophir for gold, but they went not, for the ships were broken at Ezion Geber. Now let me tell you this. You know what Ezion Geber means? The backbone of a man. If you are going to allow God to work through you and break those connection points to the world, you're going to have to have a backbone. You're going to have to have more, have more than dollar store religion. You're going to have to get serious with God and say, Lord, I want New Testament discipleship in my life. And in order to do that, you're going to have to break and sever some ties to the world. But it's going to take a backbone. So the ships were broken at Ezion Geber. Now watch verse 49. Then said Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, unto Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with thy servants in the ships. Look at me. What ships? I thought they were broken at Ezion Geber. What ships is he talking about? If they were broken at Ezion Geber, how can his servants go with him in the ships to go back to Tarshish? Here's, what, here's the deal. The Lord broke those ships at Ezion Geber. And I don't know how much time went by. I don't know if it was a week, a month, a year, or 20 years. I really don't know. But at some point down the road, Pastor Mark, 
Here comes Ahab's boy, Ahaziah, comes up to Jehoshaphat and says, Hey, I know the Lord broke them ships down there at Ezion Geber, but hey, it's been long enough now. Let's rebuild those ships and let's reconnect back there to Tarshish and let my servants go back with your servants and let's all just join back up together in one big happy family. You've been saved long enough and you know you've been walking with God. You can reconnect with that music. You can reconnect with those people. You can reconnect with that old dress code. You can reconnect with your bad language. You can get angry again. You can take things into your own hands again. You've been saved long. Hey, let's rebuild those ships and let's just go back to Tarshish. Oh, but I love this good king's answer. Look with me now in the latter part of verse 49. But Jehoshaphat would not. He looks at that wicked king. Let me tell you something, buddy. I never should have built them ships to begin with. God help me if you think I'm going back to my puke and my vomit. I've come too far to turn back now. I'm not going back to Egypt. Let me tell you something, honey. It wasn't long after I got saved and God began to break them ships. It wasn't long before old Pharaoh said, what have I done? Letting that boy go. And he got 400 of his choice servants and he began to drive furiously after me. Oh, he said, I can't let him go. And he said, let's rebuild. But honey, I'm going on 16 years now. I ain't going back to Egypt. God's been too good to me. I'm not going back to that slop. I'm not going back to the world. Oh, I got a young grand youngin in a church that's watching me, honey. I'm not going back. I'm not going back. He said, whoo. He said, I ain't going back. I ain't doing that. Day. I should have never went to begin with. God broke them. Leave them alone. Some of y'all been saved a long time, man. And the devil's been trying to convince you to go back. Go play around in this world. Hook back up with the world system. I'm telling you, if God said break it, you better leave it alone. Can I tell you what Paul said in Galatians 2.18? Turn there with me, I'm about done. Galatians 2.18, read it with me. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. I know doctrinally he's talking about faith, justification by faith. But the Holy Ghost said, look here, buddy. Let's just pull that verse out and hook it back up with 1 Kings. If God broke those ships and and Jesus said, leave them alone. If you begin to rebuild those connections, you have made yourself a transgressor. I don't want to be a transgressor before God. If it was sin then, it's sin now. If it was wrong then, it's wrong now. If God said leave it alone then, God said leave it alone now. And I know this, man, because when I got saved, I looked out on the harbor of life. I had a, a huge fleet of ships. Boy, you wanted anger, I could have took you to the angry place. I had a ship going there. You wanted to get revenge, I could have took you to the place of revenge in my ships. I, you want dope, I could have, t- I mean, you know the story. You want lust, you want pornography, you wanted anger, you, want, you wanted malice and emotions and lasciviousness, with anything you wanted. But I had a ship going anywhere you wanted to go, man. I had a harbor full of ships. But the day I got saved, God said, that got to go. We got to get the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance against such. There ain't no law. See, they had laws against everything back there. You read the book of Mark. In Pharisees, they had laws against everything, trying to line their lifestyle up with the law, and they use the law, twist the law. And Paul comes out and said, Look here, man, there ain't no law against the fruit of the Spirit. Quit trying to cover. If you ain't got it, something wrong. Quit trying to manipulate the scriptures to fit your life. There's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. We're living in a day and age where people are rebuilding ships, and God said, Leave them alone. Quit building them back. We, uh, I'm going to finish with this because I'm about done. Holy Ghost said zero in on this illustration and I'm going to be done. Listen to me. You kids, you know God's going to start breaking some things in your life. Some of you are already thinking right now some of the ships that you've already begun to rebuild in your life. Some of you have been saved a year. Some have been four years. Where's that fellow that talked to me back there in the four years? said before, four years. Where's he at? Right here. Love you, brother. All excited. It's been four years, preacher. I said, man, keep on the firing line. But you know already some of the things that you give up when you got saved. Satan has already tried to convince you to pick some of that stuff back up. I'm praying for you, man. Keep going forward. Speaking to the children of Israel that they go forward. And listen to me, elderly folk. Let me hit this, hit you for a moment, and, and I'll be done. I'm going to be very gentle. But just because you've been saved 50 years, 
does not mean that you can start rebuilding ships that you broke 40 years ago. We used to knock on doors and grandma and grandpa would answer the door and we'd connect with Christ and they'd say, pray for my son or my daughter. And my, I'm raising my grandchildren. My son's on dope. My, my daughter's hooked on pills. But you know what I'm finding now, preacher? Grandma answers the door and she's hooked on something. Amen. We're living in that day and age. We got to be very tender towards these people because Good people get hooked on bad stuff. They go to the doctor for a knee replacement or a hip replacement or something, and, and the doctor gives them 30 Vicodin, and next thing you know, the pain in the knee is gone, but now their body hurts when they don't take it. And, and they're good people. They just doctors, doctors need to get a brain. I went to a San Jose's restaurant several months ago, and everywhere I go, I've got PTSD. I, I've never been in the service. I've never been in the military, but... I got PT. I got. I've been sucker punched. I've been cut. I mean, I just. I'm just a nervous wreck in the crowd. I'll be honest with you, I am. So when I go into a restaurant, I like to sit with my back to a wall. I've always got my gun on my side. And I walked in this restaurant. It's a very well known restaurant in Greenville, South Carolina. I was preaching, and there was nowhere to sit in the in the, in the main area. It was just all. <clears throat> it was all taken up except for one table right in the middle. And the fellow said, "Hello, senor. You want to sit here?" I said, "I'm not sitting there." And I looked all the way in the back, and the bar area was lightly brightly lit up and no one was sitting back there and I said hey man what time's the bar open he said he said about 12 o'clock it was about 11 10 at the time and and so and I'm just stay with me I'm, head, I'm done with this illustration I said put me back there in that corner I said as long as nobody's back there drinking and dancing and shooting pool I said I just want to have my I said I can't sit in the middle of this crowd he said no problem so he took me back there and he sat me down over against the wall in a little booth and the bar was probably from here to that organ from me but no one was there it was lightly brightly lit up and a black man came in and sat down two booths in front of me with his with his wife and and everything was fine I'm eating my meal and about 30 minutes later I'm paying for my meal and an elderly man I'm going to say in his mid-70s brother Phillips is in his mid-70s he comes walking into the restaurant and he walks back to the bar area and he's carrying a love romance novel and I'm thinking look at this old man he's going to the bar at 12 o'clock with a romance novel, 75 years old, going to get him some beer. I said, man, what kind of life is that? But I'm, I told myself, I said, you shut up. Don't you say a word. You ain't got no trouble all week. Nobody's called the law. Nobody's called the pastor. You just sit down, shut up, meddle not in nobody's business. This ain't your deal. I did. I, was, I bite my tongue. I didn't say a word. The old man sat down right beside me. <laughs> you know it's a romance novel, too. He's got that long-haired Fabio bending over olive oil going, mm. Isn't that right? You see it? I'm like, man, that's funny. I'm just going to leave that alone. I, 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 look, I ain't even good. Mm -mm, just pay your bill. I done, I done gave the guy my card. I'm waiting on getting my credit card back, and I ain't doing And then all of a sudden, the old man, he orders a pitcher of Budweiser, and I think, well, I'm getting out of here before he starts drinking. I don't get labeled bit in a bar. You know how it is, people. Baptists just crucify you. So I, I'm waiting on my card to come back, and the fellow's sitting there drinking beer, reading a romance novel and then all of a sudden things start to change a little bit he said bartender <clears throat> he said yes sir he said can you dim the lights up in here the bartender said sure why he said well i go to church on sunday and i i, I can't make this stuff up he said i go to church on sunday and i like the church house brightly lit up he said, but when I go to bar during the week i like to feel like i'm in a bar he said you got to dim these lights so i got a bar atmosphere in here and I'm going, shut up, don't say a word, this ain't your business, get your car back and get out of here quick. I was doing good. I was biting my tongue. And then he spun around on his bar stool and said, sir. And I went, yes, what? He said, do you have enough light where you're at? I had it. I said, that's it. I'm done. I turned into preacher right there at San Jose. I said, hey, I got light everywhere I go. His name is Jesus. He saved me 16 years ago. The day star has arisen in my life. There ain't enough darkness to put out the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved. Just like that. 
That old man fell off of his bar stool. <laughs> Nicked his head on the way down, Brother Phillips, and was bleeding. You know when you cut your head, you bleed like a stuck hog anyway. He bumped his head. He's got blood, blood all over his face. He's laying there, and I'm going, oh. The old black man jumped up. He goes, ooh, that's an apostle of God. <laughs> and I'm going, oh. What do you do now? I picked up a napkin. I smacked it. I said, suck it up. It's going to be all right. <laughs> I wiped it off. Just a little tiny scratch. He's bleeding. He goes, oh. He said, are you a preacher? I said, yes, I'm a preacher. He said, I'm not supposed to be in here, am I? I said, no, you're not supposed to be in here. He said, God's telling me to get out of here. And I said, yes, God's telling you to get out of here. You can't make this stuff up. You don't read this in books. God just makes you go through. And then, then he started crying, and I started crying. 75, I wouldn't say 75 to 80 years old. And here's what he said. I, I picked him up, and I sat him back down, and I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm not going to get sued. <clears throat> and here's what he said. He said, preacher... He said, God's talking to me right now. And here's what he said. I'm done. He said, I got saved when I was in my early 20s at a Billy Graham crusade. He said, I was out of the Navy and I was a drunkard already. He said, when I got saved, God told me to quit drinking and I put the bottle down. He said, I didn't drink my entire life. I was married to a great woman. We had a great family. We went to church. He said, but my wife passed away a couple years ago, and I got bored, and my church didn't have a lot of activities, and he said, I, I thought, well, what will it hurt just to go to the bar a few times during the week and drink a few beers and, and, and just read some books, and he said, I, he said, preacher, I just got bored. He said, I, I, he said I, I realize now that maybe God doesn't want me in here. I said, sir, God doesn't want you in here. I said, listen to me. If God told you it was wrong when you was 22 years old, now that you're 80 years old, God still wants that bottle out of your hand. He don't want you going back. And here's what I told him. I said, I'm going to pray that God will get you out of here and that you'll never come back, that you'll turn that thing back over to God and pick up your cross and keep following Jesus in these last days. And he looked at me and I prayed with him and I walked out of there and I thought, you know what, man? It ain't just the young people that's rebuilding shit. It's not just the middle-aged people that's rebuilding ships. We got elderly folk, good, tender, great people who, because preachers ain't preaching against. And here's what he said. He said, I went to a church for many years with a preacher, never preached against alcohol. And he said, you know, I just felt like maybe it wasn't so wrong anymore. I said, sir, it's still wrong. Alcohol is still wrong. It's still a mocker. And many are deceived thereby. I said, God doesn't want you in here. And I prayed with him. I walked out. And I said, God, if you'll let me, I'm not just going to preach to the youth groups. I'm not just going to preach to the young married. But I want to bring the elderly folks up in this thing and let them know it's time to finish well. It's time to finish well. I can't quit when there's a fire burning in my bones. Hallelujah. I want you to stand with me. The Phillips family can come, please. I want them to sing that song, if that's okay, about finishing. Is that, is that good with you, Brother Sampson? Pastor, is that good? I preached a couple minutes longer than I should have. But young people, I preach to you. Young married, I preach to you. Elderly folks, I preach to you. I've given you my heart. I'm carrying a burden in these days like I've never felt before in all my life. I walked through that door with one of the heaviest burdens. But now I know why. Well, God's had his way tonight. And I want you to know it's time to let God break those ships. And it's not time to rebuild them. Elderly folk, listen to me. I love you. I got a church with elderly folks in it, and I wouldn't hurt them for nothing in the world. And, Pastor, I've tried to really be protective over your pulpit tonight. I get carried away sometimes, but you know I love you, church. I, I, I've got, I know we're recording this. I've got, I've got folks in my family that are homosexuals. Y'all listen to me. I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. I love those people. I do. I'm not trying to be mean-spirited. I don't want to be a hate preacher. But I'm telling you and I'm telling them, if you don't get right with God... It's going to be real bad when you meet Jesus, when you meet God without the blood of Jesus Christ on your soul. You, you've got to repent of that stuff. Elderly folks, I realize there's a lot of stuff out there to get you hooked. I'm asking you to please ask God to help you. Be very careful when you start taking medications that are addictive. Just be very careful. I'm not telling you to go home and flush all of your medications. Please don't do that. I'm asking you to do this. Ask God for wisdom and help. Talk to your doctors. 
Let them know that you don't want to stay on that stuff the rest of your life if you don't have to. Am I being good, Pastor? I'm trying to behave. Young people, listen to me. These beautiful two little girls, they're beautiful, gorgeous. Look at this young girl. Is this your daughter? Load both barrels, pull both triggers, sis. Did you hear me? As beautiful as these girls are and as handsome as these boys are, the devil wants to grab a hold of them by the neck and yoke them up with Ahab's boy, yoke them up with some Jezebel, some long-legged Mac Daddy floozy who's it to ruin your life uh, and impress upon your heart things that you'll battle the rest. You better be, I'm preaching to all of them tonight. Be very careful. Father, as the Phillips family begins to sing and I turn the service over to the pastor, I've given your church my heart. I wanted to charge them and challenge them and Lord, I want you to change your people. This is a good church, one of my favorite places to come every year. I look forward to this meeting, Brother Mark and the Phillips family and Brother Billy and his girls. I, Lord, this is one of the highlights of my year. God, I don't want to mess up my opportunity to come back, but I must preach the truth. And Lord, as the pastor has sat there and have confirmed with the head shakes, yes, he was in agreement with what was preached tonight. And I pray that each person here will get exactly what they need. And as the Phillips family begins to sing even right now, I pray, dear God, that you'd have your way during this altar call. And if somebody here, Lord, needs some ships broken, help them break the ships in Jesus' name. Pastor, the service is yours. The sounds of laughter echo through the trees From the children on the playground Right next to me I God's dealt with your heart about anything. About you come do business with God. You're here and you're lost, and you need someone to pray with you, show you from the Word of God how to be saved. Just slip your hand up right where you are and come down this altar. Christians, you continue to pray as there are those souls on the altars doing business with God. And I'll tell you this, Pharaoh's a picture of the devil. 
Just because you make a decision to give your life to Christ, that doesn't mean that he gives up. He's going to do his best to try to bring you back into slavery and the bondage that God has set you free from. That's why the moment you give your life to Christ, all of a sudden, old friends start popping back up. All of a sudden, people who had no interest start showing interest in you. That's why it just seems all of the things that you want to turn away from, they become so available and they're in your face. That's not by chance. I want to tell you, if you're going to finish well, it's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen if you take a passive approach in your Christian walk. Finishing well happens on purpose. You've got to make your mind up that you want Jesus Christ. You want his life. You want his approval. You want all that he's promised you more than anything else. You've got to be like Moses and be willing to suffer with the people of God and endure affliction and turn your back on the things of this world, choosing rather to put your eyes on the eternal things and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. If you're going to finish well, you've got to make some decisions. What are you living for? Are you living for the God of heaven or the God of this world? For your flesh or for that eternal reward that God has promised? You got to make decisions. You got to safeguard your life. You can't company with fools and think that you're going to make wise choices. You can't just let everything enter the eye gates. If, listen, if you need to get off of your cell phone and get rid of all the social media because it's dragging you down, delete those apps. Let me tell you something. You can survive without social media. I am. I am. I'm behind in that era. I know that. I stay off that for a reason. Sometimes people say, you're out of date, preacher, and you're missing out on the opportunities that you can connect. You know why I don't get on social media? I'm afraid of what it might open me up to. I'm scared. I, I, listen, I put no flesh in my, or no stock in my flesh. I have no confidence in my flesh. I know the devil's real. I know the Bible tells me I've got to guard my heart. If I don't guard my heart, let me tell you something. I can be infected and pride goes before fall and anything can happen. And let me tell you something, if we're going to finish well, if I didn't say anything else, hear me tonight. If you're going to finish well, you've got to do it on purpose. You've got to get in this book, get your, get your face out of, or off of Facebook and put your face in this book. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Let me tell you something, here's a secret to dealing with temptation. Every time Jesus was tempted in the wilderness experience, he quoted from the book of Deuteronomy. You go back and you read where Christ, he quoted from two chapters primarily. At the heart of those chapters, you find the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then you go in those chapters, you find out where God said to Israel, I allowed you to experience the wilderness and be tempted that I might prove what was in your heart. The key to overcoming temptation is having a love for the Lord God. You get in the book, you spend time in fellowship with God, you grow in your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard to walk away from that relationship when temptation comes. When he becomes lovely, when he becomes the love of your life, it's hard to trade that love for the pleasures of sin for a season. Grow in your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend time with in the word of God with Christ learn of your Savior grow in your love for him and I'll guarantee you you'll find that in the time of temptation your love for him will cause you to want to resist those things deny those things turn from those things why because you know the devil he, he wants to uh, stand in the face of God and say you know those people only love you for the things you give them the things you do for them they don't love you so you don't you, you believe that preacher? Oh, absolutely. Read the book of Job. Does love does, does Job obey you for naught? He only serves you because of the benefits. And I'll tell you, there's no greater time than in a time of temptation to prove there are some people that love God, not for what they can get from God, but because of who He is and what He's done for. Don't go back to the world. Prove your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to love him because he first loved us. What in the world is there to love about us? But he loves us. And because he shed love abroad in our hearts, we should love him.
finish well out of love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's be dismissed in a closing word of prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God's doing business with your heart. You don't have to wait. If you still want to do business with God and you want to talk to somebody, you pull us aside. There's somebody with a Bible down front. I guarantee we'll hang around. We'll show you how to be saved. We'll pray with you if you need some help. We'll try to give you counsel if you need some clarity in an area. But do business with God. If you're going to finish well, you're going to finish well on purpose. You make your mind up. As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. I don't care what the world's doing. As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time of worship and praise. And Father, I thank you for the word of God that's gone forth. And Father's reminded us that we cannot ever be too careful in our Christianity. You got to be reminded that we're continually in a, in a battle zone. And as Peter reminds us, we're always being hunted. Because the devil is a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. We, we are always being hunted. May we never, ever let our guard down. Lower the shield of faith. Or lay aside the sword of the spirit and get slack in our prayer. We want to finish well. We want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Father, I pray there are some choices that have got to be made tonight if we're going to finish well. There are some commitments we need to make. There are some compromises we need to repent of. If we'll do that, I know, Father, you'll see us through. We want to please you. We want to live for you. We want to make a difference so that others can see what real salvation and grace actually does. The world's seen enough fly by nights. But the world needs to see the real thing on display, the real salvation, the real work of grace that not only saves us, but also teaches us how to live soberly and righteously in this ungodly age. I pray that you continue to be with the rest of the service and the rest of the meetings this week. I pray that you be with Brother Barry. I pray you give him the message that he needs tomorrow night, and I pray we come back and be able to uh, worship God and just continue to walk forward in victory. I pray the ships that need to be broken, I pray you'd sink them tonight, Lord God. I ask this in Christ's holy name is our prayer. Amen and amen. Amen. Shake hands with one another.